They know I, I don't dress up very often, and there's really two reasons why. For, for one, I, I don't know what matches. I had to call Megan this morning. This is about as simple as you can get, and I had to call Megan this morning to make sure that I was dressed appropriately. And two, I'm just lazy. I mean, I'm fine with tying the tie and everything, but I, I hate wearing socks. I know that's a weird thing, but I hate wearing socks, so it's, it's just torture to put them on in the morning. So Megan started getting me fun socks to make it a little bit better. But uh, this morning, uh, I want to talk about uh, a single character in the Bible. And I say character, but I really, really don't like that word. Uh, the reason being, when you say character, it brings the idea that they didn't really exist, but that's not the case. It's strange to look at the Bible sometimes and think, David actually stood in front of a giant with a sling. He actually uh, was sneaky enough to go up to, to King Saul and cut off a piece of his robe. Uh, it's strange to think that the seas really parted, that Noah really built an ark. But you look at these stories in the Bible, and they really happen. They are not just stories. They're history. Uh, so this morning, I want to take a look at a person who we see in the Bible. Uh, and that person is Peter. We talked this morning in class about the... The, Egyptian, or the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and, and we talked about how we can learn from other people's mistakes. We can learn uh, by looking at, at people's experiences in the Bible and applying them to ourselves, and I think Peter is somebody that we can really relate to. I think there's a lot of different flawed people in the Bible, and I think the reason is so that we can see ourselves in them, and hopefully we can, we can get something out of that. But uh, the way that I want to talk about Peter this morning, I'm, I'm going to try to talk about just about every instance that we see Peter brought up throughout the Gospels. Uh, and I'm going to do that by telling one singular story and going back throughout and kind of telling his life story through flashbacks. That might not make a lot of sense. The best way that I can explain it is by talking about Forrest Gump. If you know about Forrest Gump, I, I reference it because it's probably the most popular movie that does this as well as one of the, most, the best movies ever made, but he starts off on a, on a park bench talking to a stranger and all he's doing is telling his life story. It's a current story, but he's telling people things that happened in the past and that's kind of what we're going to talk about by looking at John 21, 1 through 17. And when we jump in, and just as a little bit of context, what has happened here is Jesus has been put to death, he has been resurrected. He has appeared to some of the disciples, some of the apostles, uh, and uh, we're, we're sitting here with all these men together. Uh, in verse 1, we say, after Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, he revealed himself in this way. So it's just saying this is how he did it. Here, here is a story of how Jesus revealed himself. Um, it, it goes into a list of the people who were, were present. And you can read on there the, the list of the different people who were there. But what's interesting is right off the bat, we see something uh, different. Simon Peter. Why Simon Peter? Uh, you know, it, we always hear him referred to as, as Peter. So where did this Simon come from? Uh, and if you ask that question, it's actually the wrong question. Uh, because the question should be, where did the Peter come from? His original name, the name that he was given at birth, was actually Simon. And we see this story here of, of his first interaction with Jesus and how he got the name Peter. So one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. Andrew was Peter's brother. So, and and he's, he's a whole character in and of himself. He's a very, very interesting study. But what he does when he sees Jesus, he goes and he brings his brother Peter. Uh, and, and Andrew doesn't say much, but it's so incredible that he brings Peter who does such great things. And it shows the power of one person being able to do one small thing that turns into a very big thing. But when uh, Jesus sees him, uh, when, he first, when he found his brother uh, Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And in verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah, you shall be called, or son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So he meets Jesus and he says, your name's Peter. You know, that's kind of a, a, an interesting thing if you meet somebody and it's like, hi, I'm Cody. No, I'm going to call you Bob. You know, that'd be kind of a, an interesting thing. But because it's, because it's Jesus, you know, I think he, he was very proud of it. And he goes by Peter. Uh, and we know that because you look at the people who wrote uh, the four accounts of the Gospels that we have. Uh, we have Matthew, who was an apostle, but he came in after Peter. Uh, we have 
Mark and we have Luke, who neither one of them were really apostles, but they, they followed Christ and they met him after he met Jesus. But then we have John. Uh, Peter, Andrew are brothers, and then James and John are brothers. And it's likely that they owned a fishing business together, all four of them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But John is the only account where we really see Simon mentioned. So the guy who knew him before he met Jesus is the only one who really refers to him as Simon, because from this point on, he was Peter. But it's interesting. I, I've read before in studying with this. I don't know how true it is because there's, there's sections that don't really match perfectly. Uh, but it is said that when Jesus refers to him as Simon, he's saying, hey, now you're going back to how you were before you met me. You're going back to, to who you're going back to Simon. I need you to be Peter. But when he refers to him as Peter, he's saying, good job. I'm proud of you. You're doing what I need you to do. And it doesn't fit perfectly, but it is very interesting to watch throughout the, the New Testament. But that is how he got his name. You know him as Simon Peter. He was originally just called Simon, but he is called Peter by Jesus. So that's what we refer to him as. We refer to him as Peter. But we go back to John 21, 1 through 3, and we see this list again. And uh, we see that he is listed first. And there's a reason that he is listed first. We see here where he says, I am going fishing. I played baseball with a guy in high school who, uh, after baseball season was over, every single day of senior year, he said, I will go fishing. I'm sick of school. I will go fishing. After baseball was over, he didn't care. He just wanted to go fishing. I cannot read this verse without thinking of Tyler Thomas saying, I will go fishing. But Peter says here, I'm going fishing. And you think of why, this is not a hobby for him. This was his profession. This is what he did for a living before Jesus came. And you got to think of, of what he did before this, denying Christ. And he's sitting here waiting on Christ to come. And, and you think you've wronged a friend and you just can't, you know, they're, they're not, they hadn't talked to you yet. And you're just so worried about talking to them. So he's got to be antsy right now. So he says, I'm going fishing. But the others say, we will go with you. And the reason is because he was the leader of these guys. Uh, he was, at, what Scottie Pippen was to Michael Jordan on the Bulls, he was to Jesus what he, Scottie Pippen was with the apostles. Uh, you know, if you got Apple with Steve Jobs, he was Wozniak. So if you get nothing else out of this sermon, you've gotten Peter, Wozniak, and Scottie Pippen are all the same. But every time you see the list of the 12, John's the only uh, gospel that we don't see, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the 12 named. And every single time, Peter is listed first. And in Matthew, we have first Simon, who is called Peter. Uh, in the original language, that first is not just saying he's, he's listed first. It's saying he was more or less the leader of this group. And we see here Peter's confession. Uh, I've got the three verses uh, listed here where it's, it's shown, but we're going to look in Ma uh, Matthew 16. So, this is where Jesus asks, you know, who do men say that I am? And he gets answers left and right and, you know, this and, and this. And then he says, okay, who do you say that I am? And, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't, we don't know exactly how it happened. We don't know. But I, I just imagine at this point, all the apostles look at him kind of like this. Because if you've ever spent time in a classroom, you know there's one question that has been asked and everybody just goes, I ain't trying to answer that one. That's a trick question. No. And I just imagine the apostles doing that. They're just like, uh, I don't know. So their leader. Most of the time, it turns out where the leader is the one who talks the most. Peter definitely talked the most. He was the one who stood, stood up and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said that not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And it's interesting, going back to his names here, he says, Simon bar Jonah. Bar just means son of. So Peter, son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. And then he later on, he calls him Peter. So it's almost like he was saying, flesh and blood, your name, Simon, has not revealed, revealed this to you. But Peter, my father, because you have taken on this mantle has revealed this to you. Uh, and that's, that's a really skewed, like I say, it doesn't work perfectly, but it is interesting to look at as, as you go through. Uh, but Peter was the one who replied. So we see where they go fishing. All the apostles go with him because he is the leader. And then we get into verse four. Uh, and in this, 
<coughs> excuse me. I'm going to try not to do that anymore. Uh, they went and got into the boat that night and they uh, caught nothing. So they go fishing, they fish all night and they caught nothing. Uh, and then they hear a voice uh, from the other shore and uh, it, it said to them, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said, cast your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. It's interesting, this is not the first time this has happened. You go back again in Peter's life, and uh, we see where he was called. Uh, Matthew and Mark give a very, very short version of how Peter was called. And remember, this is not the first time that he's met, they've met Jesus. Uh, it might have been the first time James and John met Jesus, but all four of those uh, that owned a business together uh, were called at the same time. But I like the way Luke does it, and I'll explain why. But one through three is just a crowd appears and wants to hear Jesus speak. So Jesus gets into Simon Peter's boat and tells him to, to go out into the water so that he can speak. So once he is finished, he said to Simon, put out uh, in the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we told all night and took nothing. Same situation they were in uh, in our original story. But your, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish to where their nets were breaking. So I like Luke's version better because it, it kind of looks like in, in, in Matthew and Mark, if you're, just, if you're just breezing through it and you don't really know, it looks like Jesus came up and said, hey, follow me. Okay. And, you know, it, it's something to be said of just blind faith in Jesus, but if they didn't really fully understand who Jesus was, it's kind of a bad decision to just randomly follow a guy. But here in Luke, we see where he's preached to, he, her, he's, they've heard him preach to people, they've seen him perform a miracle, and they go with him. But it's interesting that they, ex, the exact same way that G, Peter is called, Jesus comes and reveals himself to them again. And uh, we go back into uh, John 21, and um, we see where once they realized who it was, they heard this voice, and once they realized it was Jesus, what Peter does is, is very, it, it's special. Uh, said he, he was, I guess he was working shirtless, says he puts his clothes back on, and he jumps into the water and swims to Jesus. Now, I don't know how far out they were, but I know that he left everybody he was with in the boat. And, you know, you can say, well, that was mean. You know, he could have helped him. In. No, he wanted to get to Jesus as quickly as he possibly could. And, and that was his desire. Uh, I mean, you see at, at the resurrection of, of Christ, when uh, Peter and the other disciples, uh, when they were all together and someone came to them and said, Christ is risen. Uh, we see where um, both of them were running together. It, it's uh, Peter and John. So the other disciple outran Peter. You know, every, every depiction I've ever seen, Peter's a little bit chubby, and I was always wondered why. And I think it's just because John outran him. Now, I've seen some chubby guys that can really get it, and I've seen some skinny guys that were really slow. But either way, John outran Peter, and he just kind of stops and looks in. Peter gets in there, and he bolts in. He says, I'm not looking in. If Christ is in there, I'm getting in there. I want to go see Jesus. And the same thing uh, same thing happens. I, I evidently have left this part out, but the same thing happens when we see Jesus walking on the water. Uh, you know, it, at first they think he's a ghost and then they realize who he is and he's walking on the water. And Peter says, if Jesus is out there, I want to be out there. And, and he, it, Jesus says, come on. So he gets out of the water, walk, boat and he walks on the water for a moment. And everybody focuses so much on the fact that he took his eyes off Jesus and he fell in the water. Yes, absolutely. He had a lack of faith, but do you have the kind of faith that would even get out of the boat? The fact that he stood on the water for even a split second is absolutely outstanding. And the reason that he did that, he wanted to be where Jesus was regardless. He didn't care how big the waves were. He didn't care how dangerous the situation. He wanted to be where Jesus was. And we see that again a little bit later on. But uh, we go back to John 21. Uh, when they got to land, they saw a charcoal fire. So Jesus had built a fire, and, and he tells them to bring the fish in. By the time Peter gets there, you know, he's, I, I just imagine him getting there and looking at Jesus like, what do I do now? What do I do now? It's like when my dog brings me a ball, he's just looking like, tell me something. What do I do? What do I do? But he's just standing there waiting, and, and Jesus said to bring in the fish. So Peter went 
aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, fish, 153 of them. It's a lot of fish. Don't care what kind of fish it is, that's a lot of fish. And I imagine it was one of those things, as soon as he said it, he turned and went. There was no hesitation because that's how much Jesus' word meant to Peter. Uh, We see here in John 13, verses four and five, it just kind of tells the story of of how Jesus began began to wash the feet of the disciples. And in verse six, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered in him, what am I doing? Uh, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Peter said, I don't deserve to have my feet washed by you. But Jesus said, uh, if you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So basically, uh, you, you need to let me wash your feet. And at Jesus' word, he completely changes his tone and he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus' word meant that much to him. He said that and his opinion automatically changed. And then finally, we get to the end. And this is, I read this so long in my life and did not fully understand why this happened. And when it clicked, it was one of the most beautiful revelations I've had while studying scripture. But uh, you see here when uh, you see John refers to him, Jesus said to Simon Peter, and then Jesus says, Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? So Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know it. And that's the thing. He really did expect him to know it. Uh, We see Peter in the garden when when Judas betrays him and brings these soldiers uh, to, to take Jesus away, Peter doesn't just stand by. He pulls a sword. And there was, I think uh, the number was around 400 people, 400 sh- soldiers there uh, to take Jesus. Peter intended to kill every last one of them or die trying. He cut off a guy's ear. That was a headshot. He intended to, to give his life to protect Jesus. So he says, yes, I think I have shown you that I love you. I don't think that's the kind of tone that he used here, but he's, yes, I have shown you that I love you. I tried to defend you here. Of course, Jesus stops him and tells him to put his sword away. But we see yet again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Because again, he feels like he has, he has shown Jesus that he loves him and he has told Jesus that he loves him. Uh, when, when Jesus predicted uh, the denial, not only of Peter, but of all the uh, apostles, he says, you are going to deny me. And Peter fights him on it. No, I will never deny you. I will always stand by your side, even unto death. Of course, we know that's not the case. And while it is disheartening for Peter, I think it's something that we can look at. And even though Peter was so adamant about it, and you know from everything Peter did, he fully believed he was going to die, but Jesus said it was going to happen, so it happened. And I think we can take that lesson into our life. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And that's a, a great thing to have faith, even though this looks like a terrible situation. But what is, what is really interesting that only Mark points out is that it says, uh, we all know before the rooster crows, but Mark actually points out before the rooster crows twice. Uh, Keep that in mind. That's something uh, unique to Mark. (coughs) But uh, then we have this this next time where Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says he was grieved because he said it to him a third time. He was grieved. I think the reason that he was grieved is because he knew what he did to Jesus. He betrayed him. But he said, you know everything. You know that I love you. Going back to the idea of, of Peter, um, I think I've, I've skipped over it here. But uh, yes, before, it's wanting to jump right past it. I don't know what's happening. I apologize. But before the Sanhedrin, we see where Peter wants so badly to be with Christ. Matter of fact, the first time he denies Christ, it's because he put himself in a bad situation trying to be with him. Jesus is, is arrested, and the only people to follow are John and Peter. Everybody else left after that point. They went and hid. 
But Peter followed him. John was known to people. He evidently, uh, his father uh, was, was more well-known, so he was able to go in into the Sanhedrin. Peter sat outside. He was only in that situation because he wanted to be where Jesus was. He wanted to follow him. Even though he'd been arrested, he wanted to be where Jesus was, so he followed him. But yet, we know how the story goes. There it is. But we know how the story goes. Someone came up to him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, say, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. Remember, I said in Mark, Mark's the only one that points out that the rooster crows twice. And I, we can't know what Peter was thinking here, but in my mind, Peter heard that rooster crow, and his mind goes back and says, Jesus said before the rooster crowed twice, I've denied him once. I can't let it happen two more times. But we see where someone comes up to him and says, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And then again, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. And finally, he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. So why did Jesus ask Peter three times do you love me? And that didn't make sense to me for a long time. And, and you've probably heard somebody talk about uh, the Greek words of, of love and agape. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what the other words that are used here. Jesus uses agape and he uses something else. And you can read that into it. The smartest man I have ever talked to on biblical languages has a doctorate in it, taught me Greek, says it ain't a hill of beans difference. The words used doesn't really matter that much. So it brings forward the question, why did he ask him three times? Well, he denied him three times. So every time that he denied him, he gave him a chance to make up for it by asking him, do you love me? And you know, I think it's something that really sank in because later on, when Peter writes his first epistle, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. So he was redeemed because he was asked three times, do you love me, after he denied Jesus three times. And like I said, there's, who do you relate to the most? Um, I think it's so easy to, to put ourselves in the shoes of these people and try to figure out who we, who we are most like. And so much of the time I hear people say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so much like Paul. But are you really though? You look at the comparison between these two characters, Paul and Peter, and you see where Paul pretty much was one of the most highly educated people of his time. Peter was a fisherman. Paul was persecuting Christians. This wasn't like just going around living a bad life. He was killing people who believed in Christ. Peter, yeah, you know, he was, he was rough around the edges, but he was at least following John the Baptist. And then you see Paul, who seemingly, once he, he turned his life around, he completely turned his life around. We don't see the first bad thing about Paul after the road uh, where he sees Christ. But Peter again and again and again, even in the presence of Jesus, messes up. To the point in Galatians 2, after he had given the first gospel sermon, after he stood up on the day of Pentecost and basically started the church, we see where Paul says, but when Cephas, remember that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. See, Peter, even after all of this, he's one of the biggest leaders in the church at this time, and he still was making mistakes. So which one are you more like? Are you like Paul or are you like Peter? And I hope it's like Peter. Uh, I, because, you know, if you, if you think you're like Paul, that's, that's a, a big shoe to fill. But Peter is, is, he makes mistakes over and over again. But you can tell beyond a shadow of a doubt, that man loved Jesus. He wanted to be where Jesus was. He wanted to follow him no matter what the cost. And because of that, because of that love, that love he was forgiven for the not denial. He was redeemed from that mistake. And it's a beautiful thought to think that we have that same opportunity. 
Uh, every time that we go out into the world, every time someone, every time we have to make a decision on whether we are going to do something wrong or do what is right, we have the chance to either deny Christ or to stand for him. And that seems like a very blurred line, you know, no, we don't have the same opportunity. We have the exact same opportunity that Peter was faced with in front of this, when he was standing outside of the Sanhedrin. When someone asked him directly, are you a follower of Christ? Every time we have to make that decision, that is the question that we are being asked. Every time you have the decision to, you know, talk about somebody behind their back or to, to say something in anger to someone, that is the question that we are being asked. What is your answer going to be? The beautiful thing is, even though we've all answered the same thing that Peter has, or Peter did, we have the chance to have redemption for those sins because love covers a multitude of sin. It was God's love that sent his son to earth who lived a perfect life and gave it for us to have redemption in baptism. And this morning, if you have, have never had that chance, if you have never had your sins washed away, uh, we would be tickled to have you come forward and, and have your sins washed away in baptism. Or if you need anything, if you have any, any faults, like Peter, we continually mess up. And we invite you now to come now as we stand and sing.